All right, all right, all right. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. This genre has been in the making. <laughs> Everybody's been wanting to hear these stories, and I, too, like these stories just a little bit. Anyway, so today is going to be a very different topic. If you do not like stories like this, I do apologize. Uh, there are some more videos on my channel you may have missed that you can rewatch. That would be highly appreciated. But anyway, I'm not going to talk too long about it. I want to get into the stories. If you are new here or you're simply liking what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love and make sure to hit that notification bell and set it to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Entitled Idiots. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. If you are a sensitive person that doesn't like the Kevin and Karen stories, um, this will not be the video for you. For everyone else, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is in effect. Here we go. I also wanted to quickly mention, I am so sorry if I laugh throughout this. This topic makes me laugh like no one's business, so I'll try to keep it to a minimal so you can get some rest. I was going to work this morning on a relatively full bus while a Karen is talking loudly on her speakerphone. Several people were visibly annoyed with her. A man asked her three times to speak softly, but gets ignored. A couple of more people try to get her attention to tone it down. Karen then explodes with anger, demanding to know why everyone keeps looking at her. The man tells her she is disturbing everybody. Karen continues to scream, stating, This is a public bus. If you want quiet, take a taxi. At this time, the driver decides to stop the bus and walk over to mediate. Karen immediately plays the victim, says the aggressive man is harassing her, and claims that she is speaking softly. The bus driver calmly explained to her that all Audio devices have to be an in-ear, including her phone, but Karen argued there is no such rule. The driver told her the rules are clearly posted near the front of the bus. Karen continues to yell over everybody. Now the driver raised his voice as she began repeating the rules, including the fact that disturbing others can get you expelled from the bus. Karen's only response was to repeat the phrase. Why are you yelling at me over and over? At that point, I had had enough and walked out. Surely there won't be any more Karens in the metro in the near future. This is the third year our water conservation co-op has been working with this Karen. We have an incredible track record, having saved 300 million gallons of water and 30 super pleased customers, all who have retained us to do more projects. So, the last two weeks, this Karen lost her mind. We are landscaping her backyard. It's a McMansion half acre for backyard and doing irrigation. She started coming up with random new requirements, expecting me to do them in less than 12 hours. For example, we put in 3,000 square foot of sod and needed to rework her sprinkler system, but we were losing pressure and had to be careful. So we set up temporary sprinklers. Well, she decided she wanted the other sod in another place even further away where it would be impossible to get more pressure. 
i.e. 15 High Foothill. I told her this. She wanted us to add a whole new line during the night, and all of 12 hours. Then she said we weren't doing what we promised. Like for some reason she thinks there shouldn't be weeds in her yard, and we are responsible for that. Concrete, for example, gets weeds in it. She also accused us of not landscaping the backyard, which we were in the process of doing. On Friday, we had $3,000 worth of plants for said landscaping. She came out of her house screaming and yelling, saying, I am a paying customer at the top of her lungs and said she wasn't going to pay for the plant. We told her we would not work on her yard anymore. She completely lost it. I started to have a panic attack. I was in tears and hyperventilating and trying to get things under control and de-escalated. She lunged at me so my business partner had to step in between to prevent her from attacking me. Later, when my partner tried to check on me, she chased him down. After this whole thing, she put a $100 bill in an envelope and put it in her mailbox now. And she tells my business partner and I, she won't pay us another dime. We just installed $15,000 for the fire pit, the sod, $1,000 worth of planters and sprinklers to turn on, rework them, and repair them. She is a wealthy white woman who brags about how her husband makes millions of dollars a month and how he is a shark amongst minnows. Also, she invited another client over to her house, showed them the unlandscaped backyard, and said, that's what we did. We lost a $10,000 contract from her lying. Some people's kids. Mm -mm. As a university student, I had a summer job installing cable for a cable TV company. More accurately, I'm the one who went around to bury the cable after the cable company had connected the cable to the house. It was during the housing boom in the U.S. and houses were going up so fast that the cable TV company could not keep up with subscription demand. In most cases, they just ran cables from the street to the house above their grass. They didn't even have enough workers to bury the cables. So, they promised residents that they would send workers out to bury them as soon as they could. It sometimes took six months for the workers to get there. You can imagine homeowners were not happy. We worked in crews of three. I was with two Hispanic men. We rang the doorbell of a home. There was no answer. We called the home. No answer. We didn't have a cell number, so we started to bury the cable just as we've done before for other houses that day. We were halfway finished when a car pulled up and came to a sudden stop. A woman got out and started yelling at the foreman. He spoke English but she berated him and insinuated that he was an illegal alien. She kept demanding that we leave, asking him, Do you understand me? Do you understand words that are coming out of my mouth? I walked over and said, Ma'am, I understand you. What's going on? She demanded to speak to the boss. I pointed her back to the man she had been berating. She didn't expect that one. I don't ever remember seeing racism up close like that until then. I had no idea what Latino workers dealt with on a daily basis. I was disgusted by her behavior. I had studied Spanish for years and really enjoyed the Latino culture, the food, the humor, the work ethic, etc., so I was offended that she treated my new co-workers in such a condescending manner. We explained who we were, showed her the work order for the cable company, and explained that we were there to bury the cable. We asked her if she wouldn't mind if we completed the job. She says, Don't you move. 
I'm going to call the police. And she did. We called the cable company while she was on the phone. We took a water break. A police officer shows up. I approached carefully and explained what we were doing, showing the work order. He looked at the work order and asked the woman if the address was correct. She ripped it out of my hand and looked at it. Yes, that's my address. The officer asked if it would be okay if we completed burying the cable. We explained that if it was a bad time, we could come back. Just then, another vehicle came flying up the road and the driver slamming on the brakes as he reached the house. A man, maybe her husband, jumped out and immediately started yelling. The officer de-escalated the situation, explaining that we were contractors from the cable company. The man kept giving us menacing looks, but eventually jumped back into his vehicle and sped off. The homeowner eventually agreed to allow us to finish the job, but warned us that she would be watching us from inside her air-conditioned home. She did. We saw her looking out the window. The police officer left. My co-workers went back to work. They were polite and very professional. There was only one issue. We had to go through the flower bed. This was before smartphones or we would have taken pictures before getting started. We carefully dug up just enough space to bury the cable and replaced all of the wood chips. We were actually proud of our work. We'd have done this either way. The rep from the cable company showed up. The homeowner came out and showed the rep where we had done irreparable damage to her lawn and destroyed her flower bed. The rep took a look and commented that we had actually pulled some weeds in the process of going through the flowers. She just kept getting angrier and demanded a discount on her cable service. The cable company rep was ready for this. He pointed to the contract with the cable company that said they would send out a contractor to bury the cable. He was polite but very firm. There was no promise of when the cable company would send a contractor to bury the cable. He explained that with the housing boom and the record subscriptions, they had not had time to bury the cables. Most of their neighbors had their cables above ground too. We finished and the cable company rep asked if there was anything else he could do while she was there. She said, just get them off my property. He waited for us to collect our tools and apologize for the behavior of the homeowner. Normally, people were happy to see us. They were tired of mowing their lawns while dodging the big cable running from the street to their house. The rest of the day, we were offered drinks and treats when we visited other homes. This made the Karen look even worse. I haven't thought about her in years, but it made me glad I finished my education. I don't have to deal with people like that now at my new job. And it reaffirmed my belief that everyone should be treated with respect, no matter how they dress for work. But the people who work with their hands in the hot sun so that I can sit in my air-conditioned home watching TV deserve a little extra respect. I'm always happy to give them that respect. I hope I never forget that. If I do, someone please punch me and knock me out. Before they were referred to as Karens, I had recently purchased a home and was in the process of repairing it. It was a steamy, hot day, and I was waiting for the HVAC repairman, hoping he could resurrect the air conditioner without breaking the bank. The front driveway was shaded with a huge pecan tree that was like a canopy of shade. There weren't many trees on the block, so there were frequently cars parked in the shade. I didn't blame them. As long as they weren't blocking my driveway, I had no concerns with who parked where. 
I was on a ladder on the side of the house and heard a car stop and park. I was hoping it was the HVAC guy, but it was just a sedan with two ladies. She parked so that her car completely blocked my driveway. I waved and tried to get her attention before she exited the car. She looked directly at me and chose to ignore me. I began walking towards the car. I am not even annoyed at this point. She can have some shade. She just can't block the driveway. So I waved again and she was hurrying to exit her car. I asked her to move forward about six feet to leave my driveway clear. She ignored me. The other lady with her heard me as she turned and looked at me. Louder now, I said, excuse me, you need to move your car out of my driveway. She continued down the street with an armband of paperwork. No response whatsoever. I followed the ladies. I was now getting annoyed with her obvious decision to ignore me completely. I saw my HVAC guy approaching, so I flagged him down and told him I would have the driveway open for him in a minute. I was gaining on Karen. I saw her stop, so I jogged the 20 steps to her and asked again for her to move her car. Just a little bit. She acted as though I am not even there, so I repeated my request, and she repeated her performance. Okay, so now I'm pissed. I stepped into her personal space and loudly repeated my request. She looked directly at me and stated that it's a state-funded street and she will park wherever she wants. I agreed, but I also informed her that it was impending my access and that isn't within her right. She repeated that she will park wherever she wants to. I ask whom she is visiting, and she says she has several friends who are on her roster to visit today. I looked, and the papers are of a religious nature. I said, you will move away from my driveway, or you can explain your right to security. And I headed for home. She decided to further state her rights, and I decided to make the call. The HVAC guy had parked closely behind her car to glean a scant bit of shade. He said he is eating his lunch quickly. He was a bit early, so I offered him a cold drink of water while I make a call. He said he's fine, so I proceeded to find the number for our security guys. I called, and he says that they've had problems with her in the past, and he would gladly refresh her with the rules again. He was there in minutes. I explained that she is welcome to park here in the shade. Just do not block my driveway. I pointed to where she had gone and left to get the repairman started. We were in the backyard when I heard a shriek. Apparently, Karen felt it was okay to push the security dude. <laughs> it's not. By the time I got to the front yard, the police were arriving. They arrested her at the request of the security dude, and her car got towed. <laughs> Karma got Karen that day. <laughs> sorry, you all, especially the ones trying to go to sleep. I'm sorry. The staff did not know it at the time, but our ketchup dispensers were empty. A boy, age 10-ish, was just smashing down on the bottle trying to get ketchup, but none was being dispensed. A staff member noticed the kid smashing the ketchup dispenser, so I went out to see what was going on. Oh, the ketchup is empty. I'll get a new bag from the kitchen. Give me two minutes and I'll be right back with some new ketchup. I remove the empty container, take it back to the kitchen, clean the dispenser, and place in a new bag. Take it out to the condiment stand and get met by a Karen. Why did you take the ketchup away from my son? The ketchup was empty, so I had to replace the bag. Why did you take the ketchup away? Go get your manager. Um, okay, one minute. I walked about two meters, turned around, and introduced myself as the manager. 
Why did you take the ketchup away from my son? Ma'am, please lower your voice. The ketchup was empty. I explained to your son that I needed to take it to the kitchen to refill it. No, you didn't. I was standing here the whole time. You took the ketchup away from my son. Ma'am, please lower your voice. You were not with your son. He was here alone, trying to get ketchup, which was empty. Don't tell me what to do. Do you know who you're dealing with? Nope, ma'am. Please get your belongings and leave this establishment. Cue the screaming and yelling. I will not leave this establishment. I am going to burn this place down. Our patrons are visibly upset with what they're witnessing. The police were called. Karen gives a statement. Police question me. I give a statement. Karen told the police that I struck her son, pushed him out of the way, and moved the ketchup to an area in which her son couldn't get access to it. I disputed the claim and offered to provide video evidence, with sound, of what actually happened. Police watch the video once, thank me, and walk out to the eating area. The officer then says, Ma'am, does your son have someone who could look after him? His father is at work right now. Okay, uh, you're being placed under arrest for making threats and a false police report. More yelling, threats, and now tears. In the end, she was charged with making the false police report, but not the threat, and received a lifetime ban from not just our restaurant, but the entire mall our restaurant was located in. I feel kind of bad. <laughs> Not for that Karen, but for her son. He has to live with that. <laughs> I gotta stop laughing. Sorry, you all. <laughs> Not a manager, but I used to work part-time at a bakery instead of a grocery store. I dealt with my fair share of Karens during this time. Just to paint this picture of how it would work. We had a binder of laminated copies of a hundred different designs the decorators did regularly. A customer would look through the book, pick a design they wanted, and fill me in on the details of when they wanted it by, what size, what flavor, if any color changes were necessary, etc. Our decorators would come in at 7 a.m. and stay for however long it took to complete their orders so usually they were gone by early to mid-afternoon. The bakery closed along with the store at 9 p.m. One day, maybe at around 8.15 or 8.20, a woman comes in and says she needs a cake. I figure she's referring to the cake sitting in our cooler, which we keep at the ready in case anybody just wants something quick and simple. So I motion to the cooler and ask if she sees anything she likes. Apparently, I'm a god mm -hmm, brilliant comedian because she starts laughing and goes, <laughs> No, sweetie, I, I need a wedding cake. All right, no big deal. I grab an order form and take down her information and then ask what day she needs it for. Uh, tonight. Mind you, the store was closing in 40 minute. So even if I could decorate a cake, I wouldn't be able to help her. I tell her that there's no decorators present at the moment, but I can make sure it was ready for her first thing in the morning. She's clearly pissed by this, but that that would be just fine. I continue taking her order and ask her what size she'd like. Our bakery was not an upscale joint, and our prices reflect that. Just about everything comes in frozen, so for our cakes, they come in a variety of predetermined sizes. She pulls out her phone and thrusts it in my face, saying, I don't know, whatever that is. On the screen is a very beautiful cake, smooth white frosting, seven to eight tiers, decorations made in fondant and blown sugar. Before I even continue taking the order and dash her hopes when she sees the finished product, I tell her that that just would not be possible. I 
didn't mean to offend our decorators, but I told her the truth. Most of them were exceptionally gifted home bakers who didn't have a formal training in terms of a culinary program or decorating school. I then politely refer her to a more upscale bakery that I know of that's more equipped to help her than we were. Then the dreaded six words came. Can I speak to your manager? At this point in time, I had been working at that bakery for a little over a year, so I was capable enough to close the department on my own. As such, I was the only one there. I told her this, but offered to leave a note with the customer's name and number so my manager could call her tomorrow. Fine then, let me talk to the store manager. There was anywhere between one to three store managers who oversaw the entire grocery store and all its departments on staff a night. So I go to our phone and page a store manager over to the bakery department. The whole time we're waiting, she's staring daggers into me. A manager I was fairly friendly with came to the counter in a few minutes and asked what the problem was. I briefed her before she went to talk to the customer. The second we went over there, the customer starts spewing lies about me, how I was rude and refusing to help her. I tried to defend myself, but the manager just told me to keep doing my closing work out back. Ten minutes later, my manager comes back. She comes back shaking her head and rubbing her temples. God, that bitch was crazy. Customer service industry really is a blast. She brought her car in and asked what it would cost to replace the EGR valve. Then she promptly spent the next 10 minutes running down the shop that has been ripping her off for years, explaining how every time she brought her car in to them, they said it was this and then they didn't fix that, so she had to pay more. So would you like me to fix the car or replace the EGR valve? They may not be the same thing. What do you mean? We could inspect the vehicle, identify the faults, and make a recommendation based on our findings. You would charge me for that? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> no, just change the EGR valve. They already told me what's wrong with it. You guys are all alike. So I wrote up the repair order, specifying... Replace EGR valve per customer request. I called her a couple hours later and told her the EGR valve had been replaced. It still runs terrible. You didn't even change it, did you? Of course we replaced it. I have your old EGR valve right here, along with the large chunk of carbon that had blocked it open. We took the liberty of inspecting the engine after the work was done so I would be able to explain to you why it's still running so badly. If you'll look right ahead here, you can plainly see the ignition sparks escaping the plug wire, arcing to the cylinder head. The chunk of carbon that blocked the EGR open resulted from unburned fuel entering your exhaust. You need a tune-up. I have that estimate for you right here, and as soon as you're ready to pay for the work we've already done, I'll get started on it for you. Why should I have to pay for that? You didn't fix it. Because you ask us to, as evidenced by the signed repair order, which expressly authorizes a mechanic's lien in lieu of payment for services rendered. If you choose not to pay this bill, I'll replace your vehicle in storage at $19 per day until such time as I can apply for a permit to sell the vehicle. She politely paid that bill and paid up front for the tune-up. The next day, she drove away in her perfectly running Nissan Quest. Well, this story happened during my time working at Home Depot about two or three years ago. 
and not the first time I've had people make racist remarks towards me. I've been at work for a while and don't remember if I had just started my shift or was ending. I just remember standing at my register and then my coworker, I'll call her Brooklyn, gently tapped me on the shoulder asking, Hey, my customers don't speak much English. Can you see if you can help me out? Luckily, the elderly couple were speaking mum while waiting for us to come over, and I agreed to take over the transaction for Brooklyn, and she'd watch over my register until I was finished, because I've grown comfortable acting as a translator for elderly Hmong customers or anyone who rather speak our native tongue instead of English. So not long after I finish the transaction and start heading back to my register, I hear a very entitled throat clearing followed by, <clears throat> excuse me, along with finger snapping from behind me. Brooklyn and I see Karen standing at her register with a smug, well, I'm waiting for my stuff to get rung up. Brooklyn quickly goes over and Karen says, yeah, why isn't she coming to ring me up? Brooklyn. She was helping the previous customers because they have a language barrier. This is exactly my register. That's not an excuse to ignore me like that. I'm a customer too. Does she have something against American people? Me at my register. No, I was only asked to finish her transaction for the customer. I came back because that's all I was asked to do. Also, Karen didn't walk up until after I walked away, or else I would have turned around to ring her up. By the time we noticed Karen, Brooklyn was a few steps away, and hence why she quickly went over to ring Karen up. Karen was not happy with my answer, starting grumbling something under her breath, so I didn't exactly hear what exactly she said, until she said it more louder. You know... Your kind is the reason we bombed Japan. Me and Brooklyn stopped what we were doing and stared at Karen, baffled by what she just said. Karen smirks and asks me, What? It's true. Japanese people attacked us first. I'm starting to get very mad, but not because of the fact, but due to Karen assuming I'm Japanese, because I was Asian and implying that I was a racist. I finally said, I wasn't even born when that happened. Don't blame what happened in the past on me. I'm just doing what my co-worker asked of me, and I didn't ignore you. You walked up when I already walked away. Oh, scary. Japanese girl is telling me what to do and claiming her kind isn't at fault for Pearl Harbor. I saw red and said firmly, I'm Hmong, not Japanese. Learn your Asian racist. Karen looked shocked that I stood up to her. Hmong isn't a race. You clearly made that up. Suddenly, Sally, our supervisor and head cashier, whom had overheard what we said, as she was walking over, Hey, hey, eh, break it up. Karen. You need to teach that racist Japanese employee of yours to be respectful, or I'll report both of you to corporate. Brooklyn. She wasn't even being disrespectful. She was just correcting you about... Oh, now you're ganging up on me. You're an American, too. Why are you siding with that Japanese girl? Sally. Uh, leave. I'm not going to stand you harassing my cashiers. Karen. But, but, why are you, Sally, Dragon Crystal was asked by her fellow co-worker to assist them, and that's what she did. Then you come over demanding she ring up stuff rudely, and then make racist insults towards Asians. I'm not going to let that happen. Leave now. Karen leaves her cart and storms towards the door, saying, I'll be reporting this to HR. You'll be jobless by tomorrow, you Japanese immigrant. I yelled back at her. I'm an American-born Hmong citizen and raised here, stupid. Which made Karen give me a surprised, 
Pikachu face as she disappeared outside. I honestly thought I was going to get a write-up for calling her stupid, since I'm normally a calm and collected person, only to be followed with Sally doubled over laughing because she wasn't expecting me to slip in that last part. I was allowed to go on break to cool off after dealing with Karen. That was luckily the only time I saw a Karen. I'm sure she was banned after that. Oh, this brings back so much memories. I was eight, and my whole family went to this glasses store, which was actually my grandparents' home. So we went in, and the usual greeting started between parents, siblings, and grandparents. On the fifth day of arrival, I was at my grandpa's seat and playing games when Karen and her son walks in and sees me. EP stands for Entitled Person. Let me try to show you guys what happened. Hey you, what the bloody hell are you doing? Why are you playing at a time like now? Huh? Don't pretend like you don't know. You were there playing games the entire time. Well, yes, but don't you dare backtalk me. I understand, but... Incoherent ranting for ten minutes. Me, poker face. My mind. What the fuck? What the hell do you want? Why are you yelling? I haven't died in my game yet, right? Customer starts looking. Pantomimes, I, I don't know. What the fuck do you think you're doing? I was here first, and you're treating other customers? But I... Takes away my iPad and throws it on the floor. My mind is saying, Oh my god, you piece of shit. Damn you. Takes her phone and shows a series of texts with someone she claims as the owner. <laughs> yeah, right. This is the owner, and you won't have your job in the morning. My mind. Wait a minute. That's not Grandpa's number or Nana's. Starts talking in a calm voice. Ma'am, that is not my grandparents' number, and you don't just get to walk in here and yell at someone. I will have your job. I don't work here. <gasps> How dare I'm just the bloody grandson of the owner, and I don't work here. At this point, I'm already yelling, and all customers and workers started looking at me. EP then runs off out of the shop. I pick up my iPad and blow the dust away. I forgot to mention that I have a habit not to show emotion, so that's why I had a poker face whenever anyone's mad, sad, or scared. Last night at around 10 p.m., I was taking my dog for a walk through the neighborhood. We don't have a yard, so we have to walk her three times per day so she can do her business. I always pick up after her, and people usually give a friendly wave when they see us. Not tonight. My dog starts doing her duty at the edge of someone's yard while I stand on the street holding the leash. I'm starting to pull out a poop bag when this woman comes running up to us yelling, Don't you dare let your dog shit in my yard! I was surprised and weirded out, but I told her, don't worry, I'm picking it up. She keeps getting closer to us, yelling. No, do not let your dog shit on my property. My window is open, and I don't want to smell it. Control your dog. Make your dog stop. My dog is mid-turd at the moment, so I explained that dogs don't work that way. I told her I can't stop her from pooping, and I will pick it up. The lady is just not listening to me and just keeps getting closer to us, yelling about dog shit or something. The dog starts growling at her, so I warn her by saying, please don't get too close to my dog, she does bite. Then the lady said, okay, I'm calling the cops, they're going to arrest you. I say, that's fine. 
and ask her to please go into her house and call the cops. She tries to enter her house, but it seems whoever she lives with has locked her out of the house. I wonder why. She starts running towards me again, and I again warn her that my dog will bite her. My dog is growling and barking now, because dogs don't like screaming Karens in their face. Karen starts screaming at me to pick up the poop and that she's calling the police to have me arrested, etc. I said, ma'am, I'll deal with that later. Right now, your hostile behavior is creating an unsafe situation for me and my dog, so we're going to leave now. She keeps screaming profanities, calling me names, and chasing after me. I just continued to walk away, thinking it will end there. Nope. She continues to follow me down the street. I hear her yelling into her phone at the police to come and arrest me. I hear her telling them I threatened her with my dog. She has a thick Asian accent. I just keep walking, knowing the cops are telling her to go home and they'll deal with it later. That normally means never. She continues to walk behind me at about a 15-foot distance. She's now yelling in her mother language at someone who I assume is the person who locked her out of the house. I hope she'll stop following me eventually so I can go home. I don't want her to see where I live, so I take several detours, but she just keeps following me from 15 feet away. I don't have my phone, so I can't call for help. I decided to head into the downtown area to find someone to help me. This lady followed me almost a mile into town from 15 feet away. She just silently followed me walking my dog through neighborhoods, business districts, and across the highway into town. She had her phone out recording me. I was getting really annoyed and made it to a busy bar with five young men standing outside. Unfortunately, they're all speaking in a foreign language as well. I turn around and tell the lady to stop following me. She starts yelling, You follow me back my house for police to arrest you. You threaten me with dog bite. Follow me now. Police won't arrest you. I told her, Sure, I'll follow you. You lead the way. She almost fell for it, but she saw me trying to slip away and turned around and started her whole yelling thing again. The young men outside the bar just kept talking amongst themselves. I continued walking through town with the lady following, recording me on her phone. I finally ran into a woman who approached me with a very concerned look on her face. I said, Can you please help me? This lady has been following me for over an hour. The nice lady said, I know, I've been watching this go on for a minute. She confronted the Karen, telling her to leave me alone. The nice lady looked at me and said, Just go. So, while Karen was busy yelling at the nice lady about how my dog pooped or whatever, I just started running. I ran through a couple businesses and onto a back street and managed to lose Karen. I walked a full mile back to my house and locked the door behind me. I don't know what kind of crazy that was. All I know is that I feel really bad for whoever was inside that house with the doors locked. I hope they're okay. Okay, first off, I apologize if this is long, but I just wanted to vent about a frustrating experience I had with a client the other day. I'm a dog walker and pet sitter and have been working for a small company for six months now. I've owned pets my entire life and have worked in a doggy daycare before, so it isn't like I had no prior experience working with animals before working with this company. Now, even with my prior experience, there are still learning curves with each new pet in my care 
and it sometimes takes a bit to figure out different equipment like harnesses, collars, cones, especially because I want to make sure that they are on correctly for the animal's safety. On Tuesday morning, I had two German shepherds to feed, walk, and give medicine. One of the dog wears a cone due to medical issues that he is recovering from, and I needed to take the cone off to feed him. When I want to put the cone back on, there was a broken piece hanging that I didn't want to mess with even further, so it was taking me some time to figure out the correct way to get the cone on. I start hearing some noises coming from the dog camera, and it was the owner. It was hard to hear what she was saying, but she sounded frustrated. As I'm working through trying to get the cone on, she starts yelling at me. That's not right. So I take a second to try and look at the cone to put it back on the right way, and the dog goes to lick his paws, and the owner yells, Do you even have a dog? He's not supposed to do that. Uh, like, duh, I know. So now I'm frustrated and am trying to get this cone on and making sure it's on right. As I've almost got it, she calls me and basically tells me it shouldn't be that hard to put the cone on. Which I agree, but it was my first time putting a cone like that and having her yell at me wasn't helping the situation. She just talked to me in such a condescending way and treated me like I was an idiot for not immediately getting it right. I also want to mention that this walk took place around 6 to 6.30 a.m. on the East Coast. When the owner called me, the caller ID was from California, so this means she was up at 3 a.m. watching my every move from the whole visit. I was warned from a coworker the night before that she watches the cameras, but this felt extreme. My coworker also said she had a similar experience with the client being rude to her and wanted to warn me ahead of time. Also, apparently after my visit, she called one of my managers and was very rude to her. Now, I completely understand as a pet owner, you want to make sure you're animals are being cared for properly, especially ones with medical issues. And I always understand it's scary leaving your pet in the care of someone you don't even know who isn't super familiar with them. Of course, if there's something I am doing wrong, I want to fix it right away and make sure I'm doing it correctly. But there is no need to yell at me and make me feel stupid in the process. There is a way to talk to people in a respectful manner, and yelling and getting frustrated is only going to make it that much harder. The one thing I will give her is that she did apologize on the phone for getting frustrated, but the apology means nothing because she continued to be rude to my managers and other coworkers. According to the owner of the company, she has called to complain with nearly every visit, although we were all doing our best to follow the rules exactly as written in her note. The rules kept changing, too, and it was just so frustrating to try and keep her satisfied. She is just unreasonable and impossible to work with. So, luckily, we have fired her as a client moving forward. It's such a shame she is the way that she is because her dogs are absolute sweethearts. Thank you for anyone that listened to my story. I just needed to write it out and vent my frustrations. Oh, hell yeah. Buckle up. I worked as a manager at a chain barbecue restaurant. We will call it Popular Charlie's. There was this lady who we called Nacho Lady. I'll get into why. She was that kind of overweight, holistic living, anti-vax, essential oil, military wife, my two-year-old daughter, who I talk to like a coherent adult is going to change the world type lady. With all the Karen aesthetics to match. We all dreaded her when she came in. 
We call her Nacho Lady because whenever she comes by, she orders our nachos at our takeout area. No big deal. But she would want everything on the side. Which again, no big deal in most situations because I understand that nachos get soggy really quick, especially to go. But what some people don't like or understand is seeing the actual proportions of everything. Two ounces of anything really isn't that much. That goes for the cheese, chili, beans, nacho sauce, all the works. Even though it is all proportioned equally, the customer doesn't like what they are seeing. And that's where the backlash happened with Nacho Lady and the Karen moment starts happening. She didn't like the actual proportions and wanted and demanded more, but refused to pay for it. Our takeout specialists were good at standing up for themselves and the rules. Of course, she didn't accept it, so she had to speak to a manager, myself or two others depending on the day. She would also order two kids meals, pork sandwiches and fries. Again, no big deal. But she was very, very particular about this one as well. The pork had to be dry, no barbecue sauce, in a separate container. Kids buns toasted, which we don't usually do. The fries had to be dropped as soon as she walks in the door, so they are crispy and fresh for when she takes them all the way home. Because of her extreme specifications, it got to the point where my manager was allowed to take her order and only a manager could review the order with her. This was always the most nerve-wracking part because she would sit down at our waiting table in the takeout area and open every single box and inspect everything, which we would typically do in the first place, but the way she went about was very Karen-like. This is when all the issues would begin. Fries were never hot and fresh and crispy enough, sent back to get new ones. Not enough of the portioned pork for the kids' sandwiches, demanded more. Not enough cheese sauce and shredded cheese, demanded more. Not enough tortilla chips, you know, the rest. The list goes on, and to top it all off, she somehow got a hold of a shit ton of free kids' meal coupons that were blank meaning no manager signature, date, or any sort of validation that she got these legitly. A coupon is, eh, no big deal. But a typical coupon can only be used one at a time with one transaction. But a Karen being a Karen, she demanded we use two out of the giant stack so she can get her kids meals for free. This got to the point where things had to be ran by the GM, even if it means calling him on his day off. He was a bit of a bitch and always allowed it, but she started costing us money. It wasn't feasible for her to keep coming back and having her as a customer because nine and a half times out of ten, we ended up having to send stuff back to the kitchen, which would always get wasted. My other manager, Billy Joe, was a fierce bitch that never let anyone walk all over her. Now she was awesome. She finally stepped up and made a call over the GM's order and 86ed her. When that moment came, we all huddled in the office and watched the security cameras as Billy Joe ripped her a new one. That was an unforgettable day. Oh. I left and got out of that restaurant industry and management because of how toxic that field can be. But I do love that I have a Karen story. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true entitled idiots. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. 
Holt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Christy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klemko, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your continued support of Back to Ashes. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here and neither would the channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe out there. Take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.